So, standing closest to me at the podium is um, Harsh Gunka. Um, as you can tell, he comes from Slovakia. No, not quite. He, he's from India, but he's been working in Slovakia with a company called Geo Model Solar. Um, he moved there at the beginning of this year, and he, he was telling me that arriving in Bratislava in January, he did have some second thoughts, but, but now that it's springtime, he says, actually, it's, it's a beautiful place to be. And, and so Geo Model Solar is a consulting company that does planning, financing, and operation of solar energy systems. Um, the, his colleague is Rian Mayer. He comes from South Africa. Um, he's working with the Stellenbosch University and the Center for Renewable and Sustainable Energy Studies, where they're doing a variety of solar resource assessments and, and solar modeling um, across South Africa and I understand across other parts of Africa as well. So gentlemen, welcome and thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so earlier today, uh, we've already discussed why uh, MISO level uh, solar resource mapping is so important. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, what are the solutions that exist in the market and uh, what are the best case practices that uh, countries should follow when uh, going about uh, solar resource mapping for their respective countries. Uh, so just to brush over the basics, uh, there are two uh, main uh, solar power technologies uh, that we look at, uh, photovoltaic and uh, concentrated solar power or and CPV as well. Uh, so the solar resource parameter, uh, when we're looking at uh, PV or photovoltaic, uh, the most relevant solar resource parameter is global horizontal radiation. And uh, when we're talking about CPV or CSP, uh, the solar resource parameter that we're concerned with is uh, direct normal irradiation. Uh, now, probably uh, most uh, people have uh, some good idea of what is the solar resource availability in their regions. and they have been using uh, some of the well-known uh, solar resource databases uh, that are available on the market. Uh, however, the point I wanted to communicate today is uh, that, uh, that these solar resource databases are not detailed enough or, and the accuracy of the quantification of the solar resource from these databases uh, is not sufficient to meet uh, the needs of the financial community today. Uh, hence, it is uh, vital uh, that uh, we move on uh, from uh, some of the well-known databases uh, that are based on uh, methods and uh, data uh, which are slightly old to new uh, modern uh, satellite-based databases. Uh, the good news is uh, that uh, with modern uh, modeling technologies and uh, data inputs, it's already possible today uh, to map uh, at a very uh, high resolution the solar resource uh, across the world. Uh, now, what constitutes of uh, a modern uh, satellite-based database? Uh, the inputs that we should be looking at is uh, high-resolution spatial uh, data at something at around three to four kilometers at least. Uh, data um, that is updated live, and it's not, not based on uh, static data, which was uh, measured uh, five years ago or 10 years ago. And uh, something that we've spoken a lot about today in the earlier session is uh, uh, information on uh, aerosol uh, optical depth, or uh, in simple words, to put it, uh, the amount of pollution or dust that is there in the atmosphere. Uh, this kind of information is uh, especially very uh, sensitive, uh, uh, relevant when we look at uh, direct normal irradiance. And some of the well-known databases that uh, people are using today or are referring to uh, do not take into account uh, this information. Uh, now, when we talk about the uncertainty that is involved with, uh, let's say, ground measurements or satellite-based databases, um, of course, yes, ground measurements uh, do have a higher accuracy. Uh, the mean annual bias uh, that we look at is relatively low uh, at 1 to 4 percent. Then we look at satellite databases. Uh, there are two categories. Uh, one, again, is the low-resolution databases uh, with uh, old data. Uh, this have a relatively high uh, uncertainty or relatively high annual bias, especially in the case of DNI. Uh, in some locations, uh, uh, we've even seen a variance of uh, as much as 50% from what is measured from the satellite and uh, what has been measured in the ground. Uh, this is reduced further by using modern satellite-based databases uh, where the uncertainty values are something like uh, 
3% uh, to 5% for global horizontal, and about 5 to 10% uh, for direct normal irradiance. Um, now, the next debate is whether to use uh, satellite-based uh, data or data from ground measurements. So both sources uh, have uh, positives and negatives. Uh, the main advantage with uh, ground-based measurements is, of course, uh, it can be more accurate, uh, but the main limitation is that it's available only for few locations, and uh, it's available for only a limited period of time. Hence, it does not give you an idea of what is the interannual variability in solar resource, because let's say we install a ground measurement in a certain location uh, two years ago. It gives you data for only the last two years, but to get a good idea of the actual potential, you need to have at least uh, 10 or more years of data uh, that is possible only with satellite data. So the main advantage of satellite data is that it is consistent and it is available for any location in the world and it is available for a longer period of time. Uh, so the solution, I would say, is not really to opt for either, but the answer is uh, you should go for a combination of uh, satellite data as well as ground measurements. Uh, if we take, uh, for example, uh, ground measurements that is measured over a period of 12 months and uh, has uncertainty of something like 2%, and then we combine it with uh, satellite data which exists for a period of 10 years and has, let's say, an uncertainty of uh, 5%, when we combine the both, uh, we get uh, 10 years of data at uncertainty of something like 2.5%. Uh, now, this is uh, definitely recommended, especially in the case of uh, concentrated solar power projects. Uh, for PV projects, in some regions, uh, uh, satellite data has already been uh, extensively validated, and hence uh, uh, the uncertainty is as low as 2, two to 3 percent. So in those cases, uh, uh, ground measurements can be omitted, but only in certain cases and some regions today. Uh, next, I'm just going to talk about uh, what are the best case practices and how countries should go about the MISO level mapping of solar resource in four steps. Uh, the first step uh, involves uh, you should have a good idea. You can look at uh, poster maps or digital maps of the solar resource potential. Uh, I have a few examples uh, that I've bought with me. Uh, we delivered uh, maps for uh, Namibia and for South Africa. Uh, you can see global horizontal radiation map for South Africa here, and uh, direct normal radiation map for Namibia. Uh, these are available at a resolution of 250 meters, and give you an initial idea of what you can expect uh, when you're going to further analyze uh, the solar resource in your country. Uh, these are available to be taken away if anyone is interested later. Uh, then at the latest stage, uh, uh, you need to go into advanced uh, analysis where you identify strategic location where you should uh, install the ground measurements. So at this stage, you can use uh, GIS data layers of uh, solar resource parameters, and you can overlay uh, these data layers with other data layers, such as transmission lines and uh, population and so on. And uh, you set up uh, ground measurement stations. The third stage is a site adaptation of uh, satellite data to bring down the uncertainty in satellite data to the level of the ground measurements. Uh, the graph in blue, um, as you can see over here, there is a slight uh, bias you see before the site adaptation, but later on it is corrected, uh, as in the red, the bias is removed. So this is the benefit that you get out of uh, doing the site adaptation. And the last and most important step is to make this uh, site adapted data available to the public. That's the entire purpose of such a project. And for that, uh, you can, that can be done uh, by the help of online tools. Uh, this is an example of an interactive uh, mapping application uh, where a user can click on any location on the map and they can download uh, long-term uh, values of solar resource for that location. Uh, another such example was uh, Solar Med Atlas uh, that was developed for the Mediterranean countries. Uh, this is, again, a similar concept to the Global uh, Solar and Wind Atlas that's being uh, developed by Arena. Uh, now, solar resource is not the end of the story, as uh, we discussed sometimes earlier. Um, just to give you an example, uh, here we have maps from uh, northern Ethiopia. As you would see when the global horizontal irradiation, uh, there is a fair level of consistency. The solar resource is not varying to a great extent. But when you look at the temperature map for that region, 
uh, you see uh, the temperature varies greatly. From the northeast of the country, uh, you have temperature, yearly average temperature at 15 degrees, and it's going up to 35 degrees on the northwest of the country. So hence, although the solar resource information remains constant, the PV yield that you would get from a system can vary by as much as uh, about 10% from the northeast to the northwest. Hence, uh, as a part of the delivery process for solar resource mapping, uh, it is also beneficial to include uh, sometimes uh, maps of uh, PV output, the PV yield. And uh, in the other map, you see um, the PV yield because by using a one axis tracker, uh, so there are different technologies available in solar as well. Uh, you can have PV output uh, for crystalline silicon modules, and then you could have uh, PV output from uh, thin film modules, for example. So these are different uh, kind of uh, information that should be included in the delivery process. And uh, that's all from my end, and I'm going to uh, let it up to Rianne, who's going to talk more about uh, maintenance of ground measurement data. Thanks, Harsh. Um, I think Harsh gave a very good overview of the capabilities and the value of satellite-derived data. And as you pointed out, you need to marry that with ground measurements. And that's something that came out earlier on wind as well, the importance of high-quality measurements on the ground. You obviously want the instrument on the ground that's more accurate than your satellite database. So here is an example of two typical solar instruments measuring globe horizontal. Um, the one on the right-hand side is about $300, and it's typically used in weather stations, um, amateur weather stations, but also, unfortunately, by a number of um, weather stations in developing countries. It's got a, a daily uncertainty of about plus minus 5%. Now, you, as Horace mentioned, um, satellite data is already sometimes better than that. Um, so you want an instrument that's more accurate. On the left is an instrument with a daily uncertainty of plus minus 2%. That's kind of the best you get from these instruments. And that's what you want to aim at. Um, if you start, uh, this instrument is about $3,000. If you, if you start adding up the cost of preparing your site, or the, of installing your instrument, of, of, of the other equipment, sending someone to install it, that, that cost goes away, the, the cost difference. So I really want to promote the use of very accurate measurement instruments. This is a map showing the number of weather stations in each country that includes solar measurements. You can see some of the countries in dark green has no solar measurements in the weather stations. This is public available data. They could obviously be private weather stations or solar measurement stations. Um, a lot of West African countries, Middle East, Asia countries. Now, so Africa, it shows about 12 or 13 measurement stations. Botswana, there's one, Namibia, two. And I'm going to zoom into Southern Africa now, since that is the reason on which we focus on the moment. We don't only serve um, South Africa, but also Namibia and Botswana. So this is a map of measurement stations, solar measurement stations in Southern Africa. Well, I'm focusing on South Africa here. Um, and at a first glance, this looks quite promising. Quite a, a number of stations. The red stations are our weather services, South African weather services. There's a single dark blue station in the middle of the country. Um, the BSRN, Baseline Surface Radiation Network, is a, it's a global network of very high quality weather stations. Um, and most satellite derived data suppliers use these stations to validate their models. And then you see two kind of brown colored stations, one down here, that's Salamis University and the University of KwaZulu Natal on the East Coast with measurements. And then you see the green ones. That is our utility. We've got a single utility in South Africa called ESCOM. And then you see there's a few dots missing here, but the, the orange dots are 
private developers. And that is stations, um, most of them, we have installed them. But if you zoom in closer, you actually find that this is the real case. The red dots disappear because our weather services stopped measuring solar energy in the late 80s, early 90s. The BSRN station ceased operation in early 2005. ESCOM measures DNI at some of these stations, but not all these stations. I've, I've included them, but unfortunately they don't maintain these stations very well. So the, the stations remaining are those at universities and the private ones um, installed by developers. Developers won't share their data. It is the um, advantage they have among the competition. So the, the publicly available data on the moment in South Africa are at the two universities. So the, the model we use when we approach neighboring countries like Namibia and Botswana is to donate a measurement station to a university and train up the personnel there. So it can be used for student projects and there's always someone around to look after the, the station and will hopefully be used for some academic work as well. Um, and then we would ask them to have all the data in the public domain. The last slide I was going to talk about is uh, that uh, uh, the solar resource mapping is uh, okay uh, for the planning stage, but uh, let's say one or two years down the line when uh, solar projects are upcoming, uh, as you spoke about, uh, grid management uh, is a very critical issue, and for that uh, we can also have uh, solar mapping uh, not just for historic period, but also uh, we tell you can map the solar resource for tomorrow and day after tomorrow. Uh, which is the solar forecasting. So I'm available uh, to speak more about it uh, later if anyone has any questions. Something I haven't mentioned is on, on this map with um, showing the stations in developing countries. It is very important to maintain your station well. So unfortunately many of these stations are in remote locations. Um, what we do is we train up typically a farm worker to clean the instruments. You get dust deposits on your instruments which you need to clean and luckily we actually have quite low dust deposits in South Africa. We, we were running tests at the university where we would have two instruments. The one we clean regularly on a daily basis and the other one we don't clean. And then we um, monitor the effect of not cleaning the one instrument. Um, I've heard interesting stories from India where there's high pollution and you, you have to actually clean some of your, the instruments in certain areas have to clean twice a day in order to get good readings. We visit our stations every two months, which is quite costly. You need to keep a good relationship with the, the person cleaning the, the instrument. Um, you always have to give him some incentive to, to clean it. And um, you, because sometimes in very remote locations, um, this morning I got a very unfortunate email for the first time we had a an incident in one of our stations where someone actually cut through the security fence, broke some locks and stole the batteries um, on which the, the station run. So now we have to um, very quickly um, go back to the station, see what we can do to um, increase the security, replace the, the batteries and you typically sit with a week without data, um, which is very unfortunate. Um, on our first station we had to put a rhino proof fence on. It is located within a, um, a nature reserve and the, the rhino likes to, to visit the station. I'm not sure if it uses the data for something, but um, it, it can damage um, the, the fence and the, and the instruments. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we've got a couple of minutes available. Any questions that you might have uh, for the two gentlemen? I just wanted to um, emphasize a point that you were already making about the solar measurements. That it's also, in order to achieve the kind of accuracies you're talking about there, it's also essential that a calibration program be established within the country where the instruments are traceable back to the world radiometric reference every few years because these instruments do drift over time. The calibration factors drift. So you're not going to have that same accuracy unless you 
maintain some kind of an ongoing calibration activity. Good. Thank you. Yeah, some of our microphones aren't behaving themselves. Yeah, I, have a, I have a question for, uh, for Ryan. If you look at the, at the dots on the map right there, you find that ESCOM is more to the left and the private developers to the, are to the right. Is there any particular reason why there's, uh, there's such a distribution there? Okay, I've just changed the presentation. Unfortunately, there was an older version that, which we use. I found that the newer one here. Um, so ESCOM is very interested in what is called the Northern Cape Province. Um, and actually, if you see... Uh, on this slide, you see some light blue dots, which is other developers, which are also merging. They're actually also merging in the same area. Um, if I go to the next slide, it's, it's more prominent. Um, so the area with the best BNI um, is the area around these dots. Um, we're for very fortunate that we have a very large river running through that area as well, coming from the higher rainfall areas on the east. Um, but we are a very water-stressed country, and something I always like to add, um, we've got lots of sun with very little water. So it's another thing to, to manage when you go for, especially CSP technologies, is water consumption. So the route we're going in our country is to, to go for dry-cooled condensers. So you reduce your water consumption on your CSP plants to the minimum. I, I'm from South Africa, and I'm familiar with the location of some of these sites. And one of them is probably near a town that goes by the good name of Hot as Hell. <laughs> good. Any final questions? No? Well, thank you very much um, for setting us up on the topic. <laughs>